Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the Tech Guy is provided by Cashfly. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy. And the video you're about to watch is a compilation of the best of the uh, weekend of October 16th and 17th of the Tech Guy shows on the Premier Radio Network. October 16th and 17th, 2010. This is, uh, these are episodes 709 and 710. Enjoy. Well, a good day to you, Leo Laporte here, the Tech Guy. And it's time to talk about computers and the internet, yes. Cell phones and camcorders, sure. Home theater, digital photography, all that great stuff. Let's do it today, shall we? Here's my phone number, 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. Toll free from anywhere in the U.S. If you're outside the U.S., you can still call me using Skype out. It's free because it's a toll-free number in the U.S., so use Skype out. That's a good way to call us at 888 888- 827-5536. Would love to hear from you and talk to you about anything that's that's on your mind today. It's funny, you know, by the time we get to the weekend, we've had, you know, a week of computer stuff to talk about. And I talk about it all the time. You know, we have all these shows we do during the week as podcasts, not on the radio, but as uh, internet shows on my Twit network. And and, you know, by the time we get to Saturday, I feel like, have I, did I talk? <laughs> we talked about that, didn't we? We, talk, oh, yeah, we talked about that. Oh, did we? And I can never remember what I've talked about with you or just on these, on these other shows. It was way back, way back on Monday. Oh, way back that Microsoft had the press conference, early morning press conference, uh, announcing Windows Phone 7. Now, we, we've known a lot about Windows Phone 7. I do a Windows show with a guy named Paul Therott who wrote the book, literally, the book on Windows Phone 7, which comes out in a week or two, Windows Phone 7 Secrets. Uh, and he's had it for a long time. So there's not, there were not a huge number of surprises. But I do think, um, you know, we've got the details now, and it's something to be aware of. I know um, you are all, for the most part, very interested in cell phones, smartphones these days. In fact, it's the fastest-growing segment of computing. You know, desktop computers are a very mature product right now. There's not a lot new to say about desktop computers. In fact, I think I might have bought my last desktop computer this week. I, it, I don't know. Will it be the last? Sometimes, you know, you ever have that, I guess, as you get older in your life. <laughs> you wonder, is this the last car I'll buy? Is this the last house I'll buy? I think I just bought my last desktop. But not, not so much because I'm old, although I... I know I, I'm a little older than a few of you, but but more because I think the desktop computers are kind of plateaued. That's it. What more are you going to do? The, the, the processors aren't going to get any faster. I mean, they might get slightly faster, but we're not going to see that kind of growth in processor speed. In fact, the way they're, they're doing it now, remember Intel for a while said, oh, we'll get to 4 gigahertz and beyond. They were like Buzz Lightyear. 4 gigahertz and beyond. And in fact, they realized, wait a minute. We can't. We get to four gigahertz. You got a you got a radio transmitter, and a frying pan in your computer. So they said, "Well, we'll stop at three some, but what we will do is we'll put multiple processors in the same chip. So you get you know two, four, now six processors in one chip." And the computer manufacturer said, "Well, that's not enough. We're going to put two chips in one machine. So now uh, this machine I just bought." It's not even top of the line anymore. Top of the line machine you'd buy would have a, an Intel processor that has six cores in one die. That's one physical chip. And then two of those. So there would be 12 processors in a machine. <laughs> and each of those processors running around two to three gigahertz. So it's essentially, I mean, 12 supercomputers in one box. I didn't go that crazy. I got the, the, the Intel Xeon Westmere chip, which is a... Uh, Quad core, four chips in one chip, and then two of those. So that's eight process. I figured eight should be enough for anyone. And eight gigs, eight gigabytes of, of memory, of RAM. Eight gigabytes of RAM. Uh, that's a lot of, and I figure, I don't, I can't see on the horizon. Maybe you, maybe you have an opinion on this. I cannot see on a horizon a computer or a need for a computer faster than this. 
I think we'd have to invent a new kind of user interface, maybe a 3D holographic world that you live in to need something faster. And I don't see that on the horizon. So this may, I'm thinking this may be, by the time I'm ready to buy something faster, who knows if it'll be a desktop com computer. By then, it could be uh, something you embed in your head. or will, or But, yeah, I know I'll be buying faster cell phones. And I think that that's what's, that's what's happening is that all the innovation, all the, uh, you know, the deep brains, the high-end guys, the people, the engineers, the guys and gals who are really smart at this, they're not, they're not really focusing on desktop processors, desktop operating systems. They're, they're focusing on, on portable, on, on small on little. So uh, this Windows Phone 7, this is where Microsoft's putting all its bets on this. This is, the, in some ways, the future of the company. And they've really re-engineered. I, I have to give them a lot of credit. This is a gutsy thing to do. You know, one of the problems Microsoft has had all along is being tied to Windows and not willing, and understandably so, not willing to make major changes to Windows because, after all, You've got to support all the existing hardware and software running on Windows. So you can only gradually move the platform along, right? You only make minor changes bit by bit as we go. And and at every step, Microsoft is very cautious to make sure it works with most stuff that is out there, right? It's a, we're not going to do anything so dramatic that it won't work. Well, on the on the cell phone, they have they are not as successful. And of course, they didn't have they had less to lose. And so they said, We're we're throwing it out. We're, we're going to start from, we're going to take that design for Windows Mobile, crumple it up, throw it out, and we're going to, and we're going to, what, what would, what would you do if you could start with a clean slate? And that's what they have, Windows Phone 7, and it looks really different. It's kind of, it looks a lot like if you've ever used a Zune HD, this Zune HD interface, which is called the Metro interface, it's kind of like a, a, a a plus sign, you know, you can go left, right, up, or down on it anywhere with your finger. Scroll left, right, or up and down, which you can't do on uh, on Android or iPhone. Uh, you've got these tiles that show you your data. There are apps, but apps are kind of in the back seat on the Windows Phone 7. It really is the operating system and this tiled interface that really is foreground. And Microsoft's making a big bet that you'll like that. Their ads, in fact, and we'll start seeing these ads, they're going to spend $400 million over the next couple of months to try to get you to buy Windows Phone. Their ads are going to, are going to have a lot of people who are staring at their phones and are doing things like walking into trees. <laughs> they're not living their life. And they're going, to aim, they're going to aim this phone, and I don't know if this is a market or not, but they're going to aim this phone at people who say, I just want to, I don't want to live in my phone. I just want to look at it, know what the next calendar appointment is, know who called, you know, and get out. Get in, get the information, and get out. That's how they're pitching these these phones. So the the the, the front screen is very customizable. There's a lot of information coming at you. It's a dashboard, and that's what I think. That's what they're really trying to do. It's a dashboard to your life. Quick glance. I know what I I know what's going on. Put it put it away. As opposed to people with uh, iPhones and to some extent Android phones who are, you know, spend the whole, oh, look what's going on in there. They don't even know what's going on in the outside world. I was just at a conference in Las Vegas yesterday, the Blog World and Podcast Expo. And <laughs> you'd, go, you'd go to dinner with somebody or you'd go to a party. You go to a party in Vegas, a party in Vegas. And all the nerds are sitting around looking, looking at their phone right now. What's going on? They're, they're tweeting and <laughs> they're, 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 they're interacting in the phone. I think Microsoft's mocking that, but I have to say, mm, that may be what people want. They, I mean, what, what it does say for the iPhone is what a compelling experience it is. So uh, Microsoft's being very gutsy and bold, and I commend them. We need that. Boldness, you know, is a virtue. I'm very excited about Windows Phone 7. It will be out on AT&T starting November 8th with the Samsung Focus, which is, it's funny. They're starting with the best one first. It's the thinnest. It's got the best screen. It's a four-inch AMOLED, super AMOLED screen, beautiful screen. Uh, all of the Windows Phone 7 phones have the same basic specs. Microsoft's watched what happened at Android, and you get a variety of phones with different specs, and they said, no, wait a minute. They're all going to have the same processor, gigahertz Snapdragon, gigahertz processor. They're all going to have the same 5 megapixel camera. Some of them will have more memory than others. They're going to have 8 or 16 gigabytes. They will all have SD cards. 
you know, they, they made a hardware reference standard that everybody has to adhere to, and I think that's a good thing. So if you buy a Windows 7 phone, you know, Windows Phone 7, I'm sorry, you know what you're getting. The Samsung looks really good. For people who want a slider keyboard, LG and Dell are doing uh, phones with slider keyboards. Um, the LG will be available on, uh, on the uh, AT&T network sometime later after November 8th. Later in the month, also, T-Mobile will sell two phones. They're going to sell the Dell uh, phone, which is a you know a kind of uh, for the BlackBerry fans. It's a, the slider, the keyboard slides down, so you do everything one handed. You know, so it's a thumb phone. Uh, so we're going to and uh, and they'll also have a uh, T-Mobile will also have a, a pretty nice phone from HTC called the uh, is it the HT Seven? I think they're calling it, which is a very nice phone with the biggest screen of all of them, a four point three inch screen. All the phones will be two hundred dollars with. Uh, a, a new contract. That's amazing if you think about it. These these smartphones cost more than any computer. Over the life of the phone, you, you got to use it for two years. You got to pay two hundred dollars up front and, and roughly a hundred dollars a month. You know, ninety to a hundred plus dollars a month for two years. We're talking 20, more than twenty five hundred dollars for this little device that you're 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 locked into spending. Now, you know, admittedly, you get it full time internet access. You get you know, phone calls, There's, you, you're getting something for your money, but that's a lot of money compared to a desktop computer now. A high-end desktop computer costs less than that. So uh, this is where the innovation is happening in the smartphones, and I, I commend Microsoft for taking a bold leap forward, and we'll watch with interest. We'll watch. I mean, you know, it's great. Hey, we got a horse race. That's the good thing for consumers. Competition is good. 8888, ask Leo. Your call's next. Leo Laporte, the... Tech guy. Well, we could talk about. I could. Talk, I, I, you, I, you know me. I love to talk about anything. Anything on your mind. Maybe you saw an ad and you said, "What the heck does that mean? What is a super heterodyne receiver? And do I need it in my cell phone?" Anything like that. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. I'm glad to help you spend your money. If you spend it unwisely, I'm glad to help you <laughs> see if you can get it back. Help you uh, get that thing working. That you, that new thing that you love. To get that working. 8888-ASK-LEO. Barry's our first uh, caller of the day. Barry's in Omaha, Nebraska. Hi, Barry. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Got a question for you. I've got a pogo plug in my house that I use to for a central hard drive, and all my computers point to a central iTunes. Folder. I love pogo plug. It's really cool. It's so great. So... I got a uh, place in New York, and I can access my files through the Pogo plug. But do you have a solution so I could use the iTunes program on that? Mm, you can't. Apple doesn't want you to do that. So, uh -huh. so uh, you've got all your music centralized onto. I, I'm going to explain what a Pogo plug is because people who are listening going, "What is he? Pogo stick? What is he? What?" So I uh, and I love the Pogo plug, and everybody. Uh, I'm glad to give them a Pogo plug plug. Because everybody ought to know about this thing. It's a piece of hardware that you buy. Not very expensive. I think it was 100 bucks, right? Something like that. I got it for $45. What? Great deal. Great deal. They have two or three models. They have the hot pink model for home users and then a black model for business. And uh, the idea is the Pogo plug is just an interface. You plug it into the wall. Actually, do you? Yeah, you plug it into the wall. You plug your Ethernet. Now, this is important. You plug an Ethernet cable. You need broadband into this. An Ethernet cable into this. And then it has something like four USB ports. I have the old Pogo plug, which only had one USB port. But I think the current Pogo plug has, is it four USB ports on it? Three on the back, one on the front. Yeah. And so the idea of that is you can, uh, you can plug in storage, any kind of USB storage onto your Pogo plug. And then the Pogo plug puts it on the Internet. It also puts it on your LAN. So if you're copying files, and this is how you're using it, Barry, that's that's successful. You 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 put I don't know how many hard drives on it, but you got a lot of storage on that thing now. You put all your iTunes music on there. Doesn't include a hard drive. That's why it's so cheap. It, it's an interface to the hard drive and the internet. And uh, and now you've put in effect you've turned that that hard drive plugged into it into a network attached drive, a network attached storage that all the computers in your house can see right right I, I can stream video over this thing yeah it's, it, in fact it, it's got some it's got some nice software that automatically if you choose to copies all the media files on, on attached computers over to it and it does a lot of really nice little things like that but uh it's not well 
You know, it depends what you want to do. I guess if you just want to play music, you can mount the pogo plug, you know, run the pogo plug software, and then it's it appears on the remote computers. Does it appear as a hard drive? I can't remember. Not It does on the ones that are on the local network. Only locally. Okay, that's the problem. So yeah, iTunes will not play back unless it sees it as a drive. Because you, what you're doing is you're telling iTunes, this is where my music's stored. That's right. And you tell it, well, it's stored on the pogo plug. Now, the beauty, one of the beauties of the pogo plug is for anybody else on the LAN, it's using, it's going at full LAN speed. So if you have a 100, meg, 100 megabit LAN or a, or a gigabit LAN, a local area network, uh, then it's very fast. In fact, with a gigabit LAN, the pogo plug drives appear pretty much as local hard drives to all the drives in the house. You know, it's very fast. So fast enough to play video back. The problem is that internet thing. It's if you can't mount it as a uh, local drive, iTunes can't be told to use it. So I don't think you can use it. You you know what's funny is you can use it on your iPhone. There's a there's an, a pogo plug application on your iPhone that will let you play back the music that's on that pogo plug on the iPhone. Right, I've got that. So I guess what you could always do is plug the iPhone into a speaker. <laughs> is there a difference into? Uh to tap that central folder over the internet? Yeah, there are ways to, you could do it. I mean, what Pogo Plug basically is doing is they're doing what's called FTP, File Transfer Protocol, but but uh, without but hiding all the complexity from you as a user. So when you put that Pogo Plug online, you can share. And I do this with the radio stations, by the way, when when they have me do commercials or or stuff for the radio stations on uh, on the Tech Guy Network. I just put it on my Pogo Plug here, and I send them a link. And they can get the file. They don't even, you know, I make it public so they don't even need a password or anything. And they get the file. It's beautiful. But it's at, but what's really happening behind the scenes, if you know computers, is file transfer protocol. Uh, it's just doing it trans, you know, transparently so they don't, they don't have a password and login and all that stuff. Where if they do, and by the way, you can't have that. It's hidden. It's simple. But I don't, I think the only way, I mean, you could, you could get really fancy and start running something like a Hamachi server at home. That makes your yeah. LAN look like a local drive remotely. I was looking at Hamachi this morning, but that looks like it, it goes through, a, again, it goes through somebody else's server, right? It does. It didn't used to. But when, uh, when LogMeIn bought it, they kind of screwed it up. <laughs> <laughs> so, because uh, uh, you, sh you should check. You used to be able to run your own Hamachi server, in which case you wouldn't need a third-party server to do that. Right. Um. But I think LogMeIn made it when they bought it. They made it so that you ran it through LogMeIn. But you could do VPN. There are ways that you could make that your LAN appear local. But, you know, the speed is going to be the issue. And I don't know if it's going to be the ideal way to play that music. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Uh, the cable wars are back in, uh, <laughs> in New Jersey and Long Island. And Dr. Mom is on the line with us. Dr. Mom is a regular uh, in our chat room. We love having her. She's a physician and uh, and has been through this before. It seems like, Dr. Mom, they wait until there's something big on TV and then they get you. I guess the Yankees are going to be uh, playing some baseball this week. Exactly. When ABC Disney went off the air, they timed it for the Oscars. Now Fox News Corps <laughs> pulled off the air and it's been timed for the playoffs and the football weekend. And what happens is you see ads in the newspaper from Cablevision, your cable company, saying it's Fox's fault, and from Fox saying it's Cablevision's fault. Cablevision, I've always thought of as, as one of the most forward-thinking cable companies in America. They understand, I mean, uh, they have great internet access, uh, don't they? Do you, do you, eh? Oh, well. Mm. I use I use FiOS for internet access. Oh, well. That's much faster you than what Cablevision. But Cablevision pulled one on us last month. After the digital transition, it was supposed to be not legal for cable companies to scramble over the air channels. Right. So that you could simply screw the back of the cable into your television right. and get your channels. Right. Well, Cablevision went to the FCC and without a hearing got per got permission to say everybody has to have a box on every television and they're going to charge us for it. Cable companies They've have been trying for ages to do this. They 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 want you to rent that digital box. There's a couple of reasons. One is they can get more channels on the same cable because digital requires less bandwidth for them right. than analog. 
Uh, but a lot of people, myself included, I don't want the cable box. Not just I don't not just the rent. I just don't want the complexity of the cable box. I have analog channels here, and you know. Comcast did exactly the same, th well, not exactly, but there's something similar. They used this digital transition to imply that you had to go digital cable. They're it's not related. Not, it's not just that. They basically said we were all thieves, the same complaint the RIA has been making. And we're going to scramble everything, so you must rent a box. Ugh. Now, I can understand them saying you have to have a box. Give me a cheap box. I don't want premium channels. I have Roku. I have Hulu. I have a Mac Mini attached to my television. I can get that kind of content elsewhere. But right now, I can't get local news. And I can't. They scrambled public access. What? Public access. I think that should be I illegal. I mean, they're, they're required to do public access as community service so that you can watch city council meetings so that people right. in the uh, in your local area can have TV shows, even if they're unprofessional. And they're required to do it by FCC law, but now they're scrambling it. They're, re I mean, obviously they're messing with you. So now what? Now what happened here with this? This happened last time with with uh, Disney now uh, or ABC, I should say. But now they're doing this with. Fox, right in time for the baseball playoffs for the Yankees. Right. It's News Corp, which is the parent company of Fox. And in New York area, there's something called My Nine, which is a secondary channel for Fox shows. So you're not, it's not on your cable anymore? No, I get this scrolling ad, and I sent you a link to the Cablevision website, which shows the ad they're showing. All right. And it just says, this is all Fox's fault. We want to go to binding arbitration. Fox won't listen to us. Fox has done this with other pro with other channels. They did it with Dish TV, and I think they were off for several weeks with Dish Television. Well, what's going on is cable companies uh, that provide you, or satellite companies that provide you with a signal, uh, pay channels to have those channels on the cable, right? And then they charge right. you, charge it back, and they make a profit. They're a middleman. So, exactly. uh, so if you're Disney, if you're HBO, if you're Fox. Uh, you will you will be pay, get paid a little bit for your channel, twenty cents a subscriber, a buck twenty cent a subscriber, some amount per subscriber, and then uh, you know Cablevision or Comcast or Dish or Directv charges the customer, and they add a little tack on a little, they make a little money. It's all it makes sense. But what's happening is they're they're fighting over how much per subscriber to pay Fox, and Fox says we want more. Cablevision probably is saying we want less. Well, I think what part of it also is Fox wants more. The only channels that have been pulled are Fox 5, which is the baseball channel, and what I mentioned before, um, My 9. They did not pull Fox News. Yeah. That's still on the air. Well, they don't want to mess with those guys. <laughs> uh, I, don't get me started on those guys. <laughs> they don't want to mess. They know there's some power there. They're not going to. No, I think this is, though, what, what is, is they did it before. It's so blatant. They wait until there's programming you have to have. And, by the way, with Major League Baseball, cannot get elsewhere. MLB.com. Can you watch the game on MLB.com? I get it on about a 20-minute delay on the Roku box, and I'll miss... I just turn off the spoilers. Yeah, that's not so bad. Yeah, Ro that's I forgot it. Roku also offers Major League Baseball. And if you have the at-bat application, uh, I think you can pay additional amount of money and get streaming on your phone, you can get the baseball game. But again, probably with some delay. Um, you, I think this is just, you're going to see a lot more of this. This is the last step as far as I'm concerned in unbundling. When it gets to the point, the only movie channel I get is HBO. When they offer a Roku channel or something similar exactly. to Hulu, the cable company is going bye-bye except for local broadcasts because we're far enough out from the city that I can't get over-the-air channels. Yep. I'm past the digital range. Nope. Lil, thanks so much for joining us. Dr. Mom is a regular in the chat room. Dr. Underscore Mom in the chat room. Say hi to her, and it's always great to talk to you. Thank you for the update. Okay, thanks for taking the call. I appreciate it. Take care. Let's talk right now with the Gizwiz. Dick D. Bartolo is Mad Magazine's maddest writer. And it just happens that he's a gadget hound. Has been for decades. He's used every gadget since the first answering machine. I'm not kidding, am I? No, not at all. I mean... Actually, uh, I had a rock that I decided should be round in shape. And I made the first wheel. <laughs> That's how long he's been a gadgeteer. Hey, Dick, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. Hey, you know, before I forget, we're, I'm pushing toward my birthday wish. Birthday's Tuesday. I'm trying to hit 10,000 followers on Twitter. Are you and kidding? Thanks to you, I picked, up, I picked up 500 last week. Wait a minute. You yeah, came on this radio show with a million listeners. I'm not kidding. A million listeners. And you said, for my birthday, there's only one thing. 
Only one thing I want is for everybody on Twitter to follow the Giz Wiz, and you've got 500 people? That's all? Well, I need 1,300 by Tuesday. I'm ashamed. So, yeah, I'm I know. Ashamed. You think I should offer the money? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I feel like I failed you. <laughs> No, you I mean, could not fail me. One million but in people instance, listening, and all I asked was, yeah, in a sense, in a very real <laughs> sense, I have failed In this you. one instance, just for my birthday, the only thing I ever asked in an entire six years was that more people follow me So you, 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 you have 8,742 followers right now. That's all. And if, if everybody listening to this show, if everybody listening to this show, I'll tell you what, only those of you whose, whose names begin with vowels... <laughs> If only you follow Dick, you'd have Dick. You'd have a hundred thousand. Forget ten thousand. You'd have a hundred thousand. What is go what? Uh, you've. Uh, 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 I'm shocked. Uh, uh, shocked. Yeah, yeah. You know what? It made me think. It, are you really on the air? I, I, I mustn't be. I think that this has been a lie that the, the, that has been perpetrated <laughs> by the premier radio networks who are just telling me they're sending sending me a check every week saying you're on 131 stations. Have some money. And that's it. There's actually oh, listen, no one that's listening. The case, that's fine with me. Oh, yeah, just take it. Huh? If you're getting a check, I'll live without, without the fault. <laughs> but, but it would be fun to hit 10,000 on my five months. This is all I ask. I'll tell you what. I, I, mean, I, I will have to stop I, doing this radio show if Dick does not get to, <laughs> I mean, it, 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 well, what is it? What is the conclusion, Dick? That no one's listening. No one's listening. No one's listening. <laughs> it's, it's well, you know what? You could mention it tomorrow because it's a different audience. Maybe the people today don't want to follow me. I'm just anyway. shocked. So what do we do? Shocked. We go to Twitter.com. If you don't have an account, make one. It's free. <laughs> and all you yeah, have to good. do, I'm, t I'm, t I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying, if nobody does this, if we can't get you 10,000 followers by Tuesday, that's 1,300 more people. That's all. If I can't get, that means no one's listening. I'm going to quit. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to quit. That's it. So everybody go oh, right now to oh. Twitter.com. And sign up if you're not already a member, and then follow the Gizwiz. Maybe, maybe I spelled it wrong last time. Is it T H E G I Z W I Z? Yeah, it is. It is. Probably. You think basically people don't like me? No, I think there's some guy named the Cheese Whiz who has a hundred thousand followers <laughs> right now. That's what I think. <laughs> it's the Gizwiz, folks. And you know it's worth following Dick because he gives away thousands of dollars in cash and prizes each and every day on the. No, he doesn't. Mm. No, he doesn't. Do <laughs> He's funny though. He's funny. You could. I try to. He'll make you yeah, laugh. You know. Isn't that worth a thousand dollars just to laugh? It is to me, but I ain't paying it. Look, listen to this one. This was uh, this was a couple of days ago. Turner Classic Movies doing all mummy movies tonight. The Mummy, The Curse of the Mummy, The Mummy Shroud, but no Mummy Dearest. <laughs> Dick does the Daily Giz with DGW. It's at twit.tv slash DGW, and we'll talk again next week. Please follow him for his birthday, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I'll talk about gardening, home improvement, real estate. That's how I got started doing computers, you know. I, I was a regular talk show host, you know, a normal news talk show host uh, who was secretly, secretly kind of in love with computers and technology, but I didn't tell anybody. It was kind of like my hobby. And we talk about the latest, you know, I don't, gosh, that was what, uh, 89, 90? <laughs> I don't know what we were talking about. Was You know, it's funny how important these stories are when, uh, when they're going on. And now I don't even remember anymore. And then, and then they said, well, Leo, you know, uh, there's this guy named Rush Limbaugh. He's much better than you. He's an up-and-comer. So we're canceling your, your talk show, and we're going to put Rush in there, which turned out to be the best decision that station ever made but we're gonna let you do the weekends we're gonna do you're gonna be the king of home improvement and uh, which i did with the Carey brothers and you're gonna be the king of uh, of wine which i did with anthony dias blue and you're gonna be the the king of real estate which i did with a guy named ray brown and so i did nine hours a day on saturday and sunday doing uh, you know specialty talk radio and i said one thing i said please please i i have a thing that i like to do it's called what, it's computers <laughs> it's an amazing concept and I was wondering if maybe along with, you know, doing the show on uh, on uh, how to fix your cracks in your basement, I could do a, a show about Windows 3.0, because that's what it was. Windows 3.0 and DOS, uh, DOS 5. And they said, well, no one's going to want to. That's forget that. Nobody be interested in that. 
that's foreign language programming. We don't want to do that. And I said, please, they just give me one hour at the end of the nine hours. And they said, okay. And a fellow who was a computer columnist at the time, John C. Dvorak, and I did that. This was, it must have been, I think it was 91, 90 or 91. And of course, that guy, Rush Limbaugh, he went on to fame and fortune. I went on to obscurity talking about computers for the last 20 years. <laughs> but I'm enjoying it, and I'm still doing it, and I'm doing it right now. This is episode 710 of the Tech Guy Show. Not my 710th show. I think I'm about three or four times more than that because uh, we only started counting this particular Tech Guy episodes. We only started counting in uh, 2004. So since 2004, Tech Guy Show, 710 episodes in a continuing saga, a continuing attempt to figure out what all this stuff means, what it does, how it works, and how you can use it without tearing your hair out. 8888-ASK-LEO is the number if you want to call in and, and, and share my pain. I'll share your pain if you'll share mine. It's frustrating. But, you know, we can also share our joy because this stuff is pretty cool and is changing our lives. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's toll free from anywhere in the U.S. of A. You'll say hi to Gina Salvati. She's on the phones today. Hey, Jason today. Oh, Jason on the phones today. That was Luis Oliveira. He's on the board, and he's keeping track of who's who. You know, Jason doesn't look a bit like Gina. I don't know why I was confused. Jason on the phone. And he'll say hi, and you get on the air, and we'll talk. If you're outside the U.S., and that's toll-free in the U.S., 888-827-5536. Toll-free in the U.S., but if you're outside the U.S., uh, you can use the same number, but you can't call it with a phone. You have to use Skype out. But that's free still. Skype out. 8888-ASK-LEO, 888-827-5536. This was the week Microsoft finally uh, took the wraps off Windows Phone 7. Not Windows 7 Phone. See, I say that all the time because they got Windows 7, but this isn't Windows 7 Phone. This is Windows Phone 7 because the last Windows Mobile was 6.5. So it's very confusing. But it's also very cool looking. It'll be available on AT&T November 8th. The Samsung Focus, and that's the one everybody seems to think is this. It's the lightest, the thinnest, the best screen, a four-inch super AMOLED screen from Samsung. Everybody's loving this phone. I've already got it on pre-order. I'm excited. So at and will have that $200 with a two-year contract. They'll have some other phones, too. They're going to have an LG phone, and uh, what's the other one? I can't. They have three phones at at and and then Sprint's going to have, I'm sorry, T-Mobile's going to have a couple of phones, too. They're going to have a Dell phone. And they're going to have an HTC phone with the biggest screen of all beyond T-Mobile. That's a 4.3 inch. But everybody seems to agree the Super AMOLED 4 inch, that's the one you want. So that's the one I pre-ordered. That'll be out November 8th. Later for the other models sometime in the month of November. And everybody's wondering, well, can Microsoft compete with iPhone? Can they compete even with Android phones? This is a, this is a very exciting market. This is where all the excitement's happening right now. Apple uh, is not standing still by any means. They have a they have a, a, a some sort of press conference on Wednesday. I you know I'm once again not invited. I don't care. I you know who cares? I'll watch from afar. I'll watch from afar, and uh, we'll see what they do. I you know I my suspicion is given the invitation, uh, which you know they invited my my colleague Andy Anako who lives in Boston. They invited him. I live just up the road, but they didn't invite me. I I guess they don't count whether it's you got to come a long way. And I don't know if Andy's coming out. He might. We will cover it, of course, uh, on my podcast network, and I'll talk about it next week. But if you look at the invitation, it's an Apple logo, and then peering out from behind it is what appears to be a lion, a big cat of some sort. Now, you know that Apple names all its operating systems after big cats. You know, Lynx, Puma, Cheetah, Tiger, Leopard, Snow Leopard. So it makes sense that the next one, they haven't used lion, and there are not a lot of big cats left. We were kind of hoping for Meerkat. I don't even know if that is a cat, but they, they're going to, that makes sense. They call it Lion. OS 10, 10.7 is I, what I would guess it would be. So, and you know, this isn't a big announcement because they're having it on campus. You know, they'll have punch and cookies and, you know, a couple hundred people will be there and they'll say, well, we're going to do a new. But the question is, is are they going to do anything else? And, you know, anytime Apple has an event, all the press goes crazy. My friend Becky Worley, who, Who's great? She works at Good Morning America, and she just wrote this morning. She tweeted, "Oh, this is exciting! I see, I see reduced prices on Apple laptops. Must mean they're going to announce laptops." But then I said, "Well, no, Becky. You know, they always have. That's this. That's the refurbs. They do that all the time. That doesn't mean new laptops. I don't. I don't know if we'll see new laptops or even. They just updated the laptops. Maybe 
Maybe. Here's, here's okay, you want to know the wildest speculation of what Apple could do on Wednesday? And then I'm going to drop it because who knows and, who, and we'll find out. The wildest speculation would be, yes, they're going to announce a new uh, version of the operating system. There's got to be something cool in it. Otherwise, why even do a new version? Operating systems have kind of leveled off, haven't they? They do everything we want. So there's got to be something cool and new in it. So here's the wildest speculation. You know, the, the tablet and the iPhone are the biggest successes right now in Apple's product list. What if they put multi-touch, the touch that you see with the pinch and the zoom, what if they built that into the operating system and they put out a new touch laptop, maybe a MacBook Air with a touch screen? I know I'd be interested in that because now that I use the iPad and the iPhone so much, I keep touching my laptop screen as if it's going to do something and it doesn't. So maybe that's what, maybe, maybe we'll see. That's the, I would say that's the, uh, if you go all the way from ho-hum, they're going to say, yeah, we're going to have Lion out in about six months and, you know, here's some features. Two, da -da 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 -da. one more thing. The one more thing may be a MacBook Air with a touch screen. That's it. Or, or do you have an idea? 8888 Ask Leo. Maybe you can think of something that Apple could do that would change the world. And they may be able to do it Wednesday. Have you been following the cable vision fox ruckus in uh, in New Jersey and Long Island and Connecticut? Cable vision is a cable, small cable provider, but I think a very you know, forward looking cable provider. And this has happened before. They've been in a fight with uh, with with other networks. You know what happens is that um, maybe you don't know this, but uh, HBO and uh, CNN and all the cable channels they pay the cable company. Comcast or Time Warner or Cablevision, they pay them per subscriber. And apparently Fox is asking for more money per subscriber. And Cablevision says no. And the negotiations broke down. The contract ran out. So people with Cablevision in, in New Jersey, Connecticut, and Long Island suddenly couldn't get Channel 5. They couldn't watch the ball game last night. They won't be able to watch the New York Giants game today. And worse, and I don't, I don't, we're going to have to investigate what happened here, but apparently briefly, Cablevision retaliated by blocking Fox's Hulu service to their cable modem customers. <gasps> it seems like they said, well, we'll punish them. This is the... the, the uh, release from Hulu. Unfortunately, we were put in a position of, well, wait a minute, now wait a minute. I guess Hulu, wait a minute. Hulu blocked, I'm, I'm confused. Hulu blocked Cablevision? Maybe that's what happened. According to All Things Digital, quote, this is a quote from Hulu Public Relations rep Elisa Schreiber. Unfortunately, we were put in a position of needing to block Fox content on Hulu in order to remain neutral during, oh, I see. So you could have watched Fox stuff even though on the web, right? Even though it was being blocked on the cable TV in order to remain neutral during contract negotiations between Fox and Cablevision. This only includes Fox content. All other Hulu content is accessible on Cablevision. We regret to impact Cablevision customers. Look forward to returning Fox content. So I see what happened. K Hulu decided, oh, we're going to pull Fox content from Hulu. This is ugly. But see, that was kind of a loophole, wasn't it? So, well, you, I don't get Channel 5, but I can still watch it on the Internet. So they decided, well, we're not going to let you watch it on the Internet. Oh, how can can we just move along and just say, cable companies, it's over. Thank you very much. You are now bandwidth providers. We just need high-speed internet. We'll handle it from here. We'll just get the shows we want from the content providers themselves. We'll, we'll go a la carte. We'll listen to just what we want. We'll pay for just what we want. You've done a nice job. We'll see you later. Can we just please say that? Leo Laporte, the tech guy, let's go to your calls right after this. We had a caller yesterday who was hooking up his TV set. He had a, you know, a big screen TV set to his computer. He wanted to watch TV from the computer. You know, that's, I think a lot of people are doing that. Home theater PC, they call it HTPC. And he had the, uh, the computer had DVI, DVI connector, that digital video connector. And you can get an inexpensive device that turns that into HDMI. So he had that plugged into the screen. That worked fine. The problem is you're, you're not getting audio because you're only getting the DVI out. So even though HDMI will carry audio, you're only getting video. So he's, he's got to get the audio out of the computer. And what he was doing was just a little mini jack into the computer sound card, 
plugged into the TV. So it was analog audio out of the computer into the television. And he says, you know, the, the nice thing about doing this is he can, he can see his computer screen. So he can have a keyboard and a mouse, wireless keyboard and mouse, and he can surf. So he said, but every time I open my browser, I hear this whine, this high-pitched <laughs> coming, <laughs> coming out of the TV. And I said, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's probably uh, radio frequency interference coming out of the, the laptop or the de whatever he's using, the desktop, out of the sound card. Because if you think about it, your, your computer, you've got this processor in here, this 3 gigahertz processor. I mean, it's, it's broadcasting. That thing is, that's on radio frequencies, practically. That's an FM frequency. Isn't 2.4 megahertz an FM frequency? Anyway, it's broadcasting on a multiple of an FM frequency, and so it's just, it's, there's a lot of noise. So I suggested he get a device that would take USB out of the computer, so just take the bits out of the computer, and then convert it to analog later. And lo and behold, I happen to have one. It's so funny, because but like an hour later, I opened a box and there it there it was and this is a high end audio file device but it seems like a very good choice for somebody who wants to do exactly that it's called the HRT Music Streamer 2 it's a little price it's 150 bucks but that what you're paying for is the digital to analog converter uh, which is in other words by buying a an expensive external device you're doing two things first you're getting the audio conversion away from the noisy computer, but also you're using a better DAC, digital analog converter, than the cheap one on your sound card. And uh, this HRT, we actually been playing with this a little bit. J did you try it, John? I did. did it sound good? Sounds very good. Yeah. So I wanted to just kind of follow up on yesterday's show and tell, and tell our caller, I hope he's listening today, HRT Music Streamer 2. Is you can get it at Amazon. It's about 150 bucks. It's a it's a D to A converter. It takes the USB audio from your computer and turns it into uh, analog audio away from your computer with a much higher quality uh, stream. They have a they have a 150 dollar device, and I think they also have a 250 dollar device depending on the quality you want. But 150 probably is enough. And you can get cheaper ones. You can get 31 dollar ones, uh, things like that. I'm not sure I'd recommend them, uh, but you can get them. For less. But the idea, you know, the, the cheaper ones won't give you an improved DAC, but they will get it away from the computer. That's kind of what you want to do. That's the first step. Michael in Des Moines. Thanks for letting me follow up on that call, Michael. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hey, Leo. Hey, Michael. Hey. Nice to talk to you. What can I do for you today? Well, I, uh, where I work at, uh, apparently the IT department and in their infinite wisdom uh, realized I didn't work there, and so did the, they deleted my... Uh, email account and the whole works and so when they got it all back I lost all my email and my calendar and I can't get that back but I was I got a I got a guy here who works in IT for Quiznos and he's shaking his head that wasn't a good move on their part was it they just deleted no, they deleted your account entirely yeah it was completely I could not even log in on my work computer no more and then so you call them and they say oops and they create a new account. Instead of instead of restoring your old account, they created a new account for you, which has none of your email, none of your calendar, anything. Yeah, I lost everything for about three years. <laughs> now, they were presumably using Exchange, Microsoft Exchange, I would guess. Do you know? Uh, it was Outlook uh, yeah. 2007. Yeah, so I'm sure that their server was Exchange. Eric might know this. He's sitting right here. Do you, use, do you guys use Exchange? If they delete an Exchange account, there must be somewhere they can restore that account from, right? In their backups or something. He's saying, yeah. What you got to do is... You can't... By the way, you can't do it. If you don't have any access to it, Michael. Yeah. You got to go to back to the IT department and say, um, dudes, <laughs> that's three years of data you lost. Now, Dan, who also is he's in our chat room, he's our chat mod, and he also works with Exchange. He says, it's not all that easy. He says uh, 2002 R2 Active Directory accounts go into a recycle bin. So if they have the most recent version of Exchange, there is a recycle bin. And if they haven't emptied that yet, just like on your desktop, they might be able to just drag it out of the recycle bin. He says before that, earlier versions, which most people are still using, that's, that's you know, most people don't upgrade the Exchange very fast. Um, he says it's not going to be that easy, but you've got to talk them into it. I would suggest chocolates. <laughs> right? A big, Eric says, a big 
Quiznos sub would work as well. <laughs> it's toasted, you know. <laughs> or chocolates. <laughs> or both. And maybe a bottle of wine. In other words, you can't, there's nothing you can do, Michael. You have to get them to do it. Okay. So now for future reference, Leo. for future, are you watching? Hey, for future reference, you can back up even your corporate data. You know, you can export out of Outlook all of your stuff, and that's not a bad idea. You, you wouldn't think with, a, with an IT department and people doing this professionally, you'd have to worry about that. But maybe if you've got three years of data, this is a warning call to all of us. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Chris Marquardt, the photo guy. And we have a photo assignment to review. Hello, Chris. Hello, Leo. How are you? I'm great. I haven't talked to you in ages. Chris is the uh, podcaster who creates the incredible Tips from the Top Floor podcast. You can find out more about him at chrismarquart.com. And it's been, has it been a month already? Yeah, I think so. I've been wow. so busy doing workshops and traveling. and uh, ah, But now the workshop season is over and uh, I can come back and be here more often if you... If you let me. I love having you on. Are you kidding? No problem <laughs> with that. And today we're going to take a look at uh, our assignment, which was, if you'll remind me. It was heat, no flame. Heat, no you, flame. You know how we do these, um, uh, we call them iron photographers. It's a bit like an iron chef. You get some ingredients and this time it was heat and no flame. And I've chosen three images to review and then I'm going to give you a new assignment. So we should explain how this works, the way it works. It's not a contest. It's not a competition. It is merely There's a chance. There's nothing to win. <laughs> There's nothing to win. It's just a chance for you uh, to have some fun and, and really take more pictures. And so uh, what we do is uh, once a month we give you an assignment like take a picture showing in some way the concept of heat but, but no flames allowed. And yes. uh, then once you take the picture, you go to Flickr, F-L-I-C-K-R.com. It's free to join. And if you have a Yahoo account, you already have a Flickr account because they're part of Yahoo. And, and join the Tech Guy group, also free to join within Flickr. And then upload your photo. Tag it with heat so we know. Orbit Gal uh, is our moderator there. She'll say thank you for your submission. And once a week, you can add another picture. And then once a month... Chris will look at all the submissions and pick three to, to talk about. It's kind of strange because I know you're talking about pictures on the radio, but Chris is very good at describing <laughs> these images. <laughs> I do that all the time on the podcast. Yeah, so yeah. Um, let's, let's just uh, dive right into it. The first one is called Geothermal Heat, Geothermal Heating. It's by Nelspin. And this is, this is something. He must have been uh, somewhere near a volcano to get this. And I didn't even think of it. I mean, I love when, when, when the participants kind of think, think outside the box. And this one is clearly one of those. Uh, th there's certainly a lot of heat. It's a hot spring of some sort it, somewhere in the desert. I'm Bubbling. not sure. Oh, Yellowstone. Oh, it says Yellowstone, oh, yeah. actually. Well, that's where, that's where Old Faithful, the geyser, is. So this oh, this yeah. is probably a little baby geyser. So this one, yeah, it shows heat, no flame. And, and actually what he did is he uses the opposite of flame. I love the way he composed this because he's, he's deliberately not showing everything. He's deliberately leaving stuff out, which, which you as a viewer um, get, to, get to do some work when you watch the picture. You get to complete it. You get to add your own bit of the story to it. So um, pretty cool the colors, um, pretty nice color contrast between the bluish water and the yellowish uh, ground around it, uh, especially in the background. So you have this primary color contrast, blue and yellow, which um, always tends to work really well. So the subdued colors, but still some color contrast there. Um, the nice composition frozen. too. He's not centered on the boiling water. It's totally it's, not. Yeah, and and it's and it's and it's frozen. The water's frozen, but not from a temperature point, but from a timing point of view, because he chose a very short shutter speed, so the whole picture. It looks like it's it's frozen right in mid mid motion, which is really nice. It looks like, like nature's jacuzzi. Somebody said in the chat room. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you you with water, you can go either way. You can do a long exposure and get this nice soft, fuzzy water, or you could do a freeze. You know, sh sh short, sh uh, very quick shutter speed, and the water, and the bubbles are actually frozen in the air, and I like that too. If 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 your camera has a a, a time priority or shutter priority setting, I think on Canon's it's TV mode. On Nikon is the S mode. Um, play with that. Set it mm -hmm. on that mode and then choose a longer shutter speed and, and deliberately blur some motion that will give you some really nice effects. So that's number one. Let's uh, go to the next one. This is from Welcho, W-E-L-C-H-O. Yep. And <laughs> that one is that's called hot. Heat. 
<laughs> it's, it's a, a toaster. It's a toaster. Um, it's, I, I think it could use a bit, bit of brighter exposure, a bit more light. But in general, I, I really like what he's done there because look at, look at it. It's, it, okay, what, what's he doing? Um, <laughs> you see the toast coming out of the toaster. It's kind of frozen, but then you see it's being translucent. So he, it's almost kind of a double exposure. You know, like you, when you do this with uh, with people, you get like ghost people on there. Mm -hmm. um, How could he do ghost that? Toast? How, would you do it with a long exposure and uh, just have it the toast pop up during the ten second exposure, something like that? What he what he did is he did a long exposure, but he used flash. I so see. So part of the toaster is exposed before the flash goes off, and then the toast pops up, and then he hits the toast with the flash while it's popping up. So that freezes the toast. So you have this. Um, professionals call that dragging the shutter, where you have part of the picture normally exposed and part illuminated with a flash, and that's what's happened. And here. it really, so so it really is a double exposure, uh, but with it one. It is kind of a double shot. exposure, but it happens. Yeah, it happens within a second or two, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So um, if if you do something like that in a dark room, um, most modern DSLRs can, or even even point and shoots will do that. Just set it to use the flash and. Uh, then the camera will do a long exposure and then it'll freeze part of the motion. This way you can get some really nice effects. Also, also by taking pictures of people, for example. Very a mixture of blur and and a sharp part of the picture. I, I think you have gives, a fondness. A, I think you have a fondness for this uh, technique because you've picked uh, dragging the shutter tech, uh, shots several times yep, now. Yep, yep. <laughs> and the third picture. Um, now that is even more extreme, and uh, you obviously can see what that is, even though it's kind of very blurry. Um, it's called Red Hot. It's by Jay Hudo, and it is the it's a stove in a kitchen. It looks like yeah, it looks like the uh, red elements from an electric stove, but it's kind of blurry. It looks like another either multiple exposure or something like that, right? Well, it's a, this and this one is a long exposure. It's just a long exposure. So what he did is he held the camera. Um, and he deliberately moved it while exposing I long. I, I think he probably took an exposure longer than a second for this. Now, this is, ends up being in an abstract shot. It really isn't, uh, you know, you don't look at it and say, I know what that is. It's about color and shape. And yeah, the it's red color and shape, but, but the red spiral yeah. kind of gives it away. So, right. so this one being very, very creative, very abstract will give you at least an idea what it is and it'll make you work it'll make you work it'll make your mind start coming up with uh, trying to explain what it's seeing there sometimes a picture doesn't have to be of something it can be abstract and just be you like the colors you like the composition you like the shapes right um yeah and and for the next assignment i actually want to go kind of go into this direction i want to try a bit of a more creative approach okay so today I'll give you an iron photographer assignment again, which again is like an iron chef, just with photography. Um, this one's a bit of a special one. I'll give you some ingredients that you have to have in your photo. Okay. And then I'll garnish that whole thing with a twist. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are kind of three ingredients. First is orange. Which orange, can be okay. the color or whatever. Um, second is eyes. Third is no pumpkin. Because <laughs> so it is these Halloween. Are, All right. <laughs> these are the three. These are the three ingredients: orange eyes and no pumpkin. But here's the real twist. You know how a lot of times you shoot um, your pictures by certain rules, stuff like hold the camera straight, have your subject in focus, right. expose well. Right. Um, all these kind of rules that are somewhere ingrained deep in your mind, and most photographers have those kind of rules. Uh, for this assignment, I want everyone who participates to identify the most important rule. And throw it overboard. So it, for you, the most important rule might be focus, might be horizon. <laughs> might, might be exposure. Um, if you always hold the camera straight, this is the time to skew the image. If you always take painstakingly care to not introduce camera shake, this is the time to start oh, wow. experimenting with the longer shutter speed and deliberately shake the camera. So we're going to play time with the idea of breaking the rules because sometimes rules are made to be broken. Yes. So orange eyes, no pumpkin, but find your biggest rule and bend it. That's the most important the thing. The eyes don't have to be orange. It just has to have some eyes in it. <laughs> has, it has to have eyes. It has to have something orange in it. And, and it has no to have a, no pumpkin and it has to have a rule. One of the canon rules of photography, like straight horizon, <laughs> in focus, properly exposed, or all three if you want. In fact, you've got an example image uh, from your Flickr uh, stream. Uh, of uh, it looks like it's a museum, 
and somebody it is, is kind walking of a museum. And, and yeah, someone's walking, and and I deliberately took this picture, um, didn't hold the camera straight, shot it from an unusual perspective. Yeah, you're on the overexposed floor. Overexposed it. I'm lying on the floor. <laughs> overexposed it. Um, but, but get I, it out but of focus. But it tells a story, doesn't it? I take it, yes. And I take it you want to get a, a photo that still is a good photo. Well, yes. <laughs> but good doesn't Which, have to mean perfectly executed. Good means it tells a story, it captures the eye, it captures the and, imagination, something like that. It appeals yes, and, to the aesthetics. And simply by bending your most important rule, there's a pretty good chance that the picture will do something with the viewer that it, that your pictures usually don't. So this is a good way to extend your creative toolbox and, and add some more tools. It's your there. chance to be a Monet or a Picasso. Yes, exactly. Instead of an Ansel Adams. Chris <laughs> Marquardt is at chrismarquardt.com. Do listen to his podcast. It's a great show. Tips from the top floor. You'll find a link there, and uh, we'll see you at uh, sooner than a month. I think uh, I'm hoping we can see you uh, more often these days. Now that you have a little more time, I'll be available every week if you want to. Great, thank you, Chris. Absolutely, great to talk to you. Take care.